Today on Game Talk Live, we're discussing the severity of game-related crimes along with YouTube's latest policy changes and what they mean for smaller content creators. Let's get to the news. I'm Andy Roman and welcome to Game Talk Live where we discuss the biggest video game news of the day live with help from our Facebook chat audience. Joining me now are three expert guests to discuss these gaming topics and more. First up is Evan Rayner. He's a content creator, host, and professional esports broadcaster for Hi Res Studios. His YouTube channel, Rain Day Gaming, has already amassed over 160,000 subscribers for his gaming insights, positive atmosphere, and lighthearted humor around the games he covers. Welcome aboard, Evan. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Also joining us today is Natty Casanova, a.k.a. The Zombie Unicorn, is an esteemed Twitch and YouTube partner, not to mention the season one winner of Fox's reality competition, Kicking and Screaming. Welcome back, Natty. Thanks. Hi. How's it going? Hello. Good. Thanks. <laughs> and also joining us today is Rourke Bose. He has been working in the channel network business and YouTube certified since 2013. He's also the host of a new retro gaming segment on Arcade Cloud live starting tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific at twitch.tv slash arcade cloud. Welcome, Rourke. Thanks for having me. Fantastic, let's get right into it. A little less than one month into the new year, YouTube has garnered unwanted attention yet again as its smaller content creators become concerned for the future of their channels. The video sharing site announced that channels will need to meet a minimum of 4,000 hours of watch time over the course of 12 months and maintain 1,000 subscribers in order to join YouTube's partner program and become eligible to monetize content. The company says that 99% of their creators are making less than $100 per year off of their service and that these compromises are necessary in order to protect the community as a whole. Is there still a place for aspiring creatives to thrive on the platform or on new content creators, SOL? Evan, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this is definitely my kind of area of, of, of expertise. Obviously, I'm, I'm big on YouTube in terms of this is, this is my life. You know, I go out there, I work in the gaming industry and also in YouTube. So I have the pleasure of seeing both the, sometimes the corporate side of decisions and sometimes obviously how it feels when you're the consumer or you're the one using a platform like YouTube, which has given a lot of people hope. I think the biggest problem right now is that people are losing that hope. And I think the way that YouTube is is doing what they're doing is also hurting what they're actually doing. Their communication is really poor. It's it's very bad and it seems very favorited towards people who are making them a lot of money. And this is just further evidence to a lot of people who already believe that YouTube is favoring the top creators, that small creators mean nothing to this business. We have to remember that YouTube does not pull a profit. They do not make money yet. It is something that is a very hard thing to figure out in terms of uh, you know, the big business and really turning an in income. But overall, this has definitely been a damper, but I don't think this is the end. I think this is still a, a pretty decent step for them. It's a, You gotta get in depth to it, and I don't wanna take too much time. I can elaborate later after uh, some of the other guests speak, but I think there's definitely hope for the small creator. It just is a tough time to make such a controversial statement without giving enough feedback to those who really wanna grow big on this platform. Uh, Natty, do you think the uproar from the smaller creators is justified? Um, you know, having started on YouTube, obviously, as everybody starts as a small creator, I think that I would have been really frustrated if this was me. But at the same time, at that level, I'm not making much anyways, a dollar, two dollars, whatever, maybe a month if you're if you're at this level. And I think that what they're doing is has good intentions. They are trying to make it better for the whole, especially with all the ads being pulled from YouTube. I've seen a huge down you know, downward trend on my channel since the ad's been pulled. And I, I've kind of stopped caring about YouTube ever since then. So if this is going to help bring that back up and bring more advertisers back to YouTube, I think it's going to help overall. That's what I think. Uh, so, Rourke, how do, you, how do you think our smaller creators still going to be able to thrive on the platform? Well, I mean, I think that that question would lead us to believe that uh, smaller creators, you know, how are they defining thrive, right? Because as was mentioned, when people are making less than $100 annually, I think that the outcry that they are losing their livelihood is overstated. Uh, does it discourage smaller creators, perhaps, because there's no financial uh, short-term impact on what they're trying to become? Maybe, but I feel like if you're somebody who's a consistent creator, the difference between you making $12 a month and not making $12 a month shouldn't be what separates you from becoming 
uh, a big member on the platform, especially when the compromise is to reinstall uh, advertiser confidence. Without advertiser confidence, we're not going to have bigger creators wanting to be on YouTube anymore because they're going to go to platforms that have those advertisers. Yeah. Uh, Evan, yeah. do you think this will limit uh, the potential for growth? Well, I mean, personally, Rourke hit it like nail on the head. I, I honestly think that the biggest reason YouTube did this because advertisers are pulling away and they are losing confidence in the platform and they need to be secure that what they're putting on isn't going to get advertised next to a dead body or somebody, you know, having something very controversial happening to them. You don't want to see a Pepsi ad, somebody dying. That's not what Pepsi's looking for. And so at this day and age, you have to make these types of decisions to protect the platform as a whole. The only thing that sucks about it, and I think, again, goes back to my other thing, is as a content creator, I deal with demonetization every day. I put hours and hours into a video, and it will immediately just get kind of thrown down because the demonetization system and the algorithm doesn't really support content, and even if it's fair content, even if I'm doing the right thing. And I think communication is what has been missing from this platform in the biggest sense. It's okay that they're doing this. It really doesn't make that much of a difference. If you're gonna grind from nothing to being something on YouTube, the first, you know, 100 bucks, it doesn't mean anything. It shouldn't stop anyone who's really motivated. But the problem is it's not communicated well that that's still the the situation here. Uh, and again, it just goes to show that I, I want to see more communication in depth from YouTube to its partners, really showing that they care. Uh, have you ever tried to fight uh, a video being demonetized? Uh, oh, yeah. You have. And All have the you, time. Have you won? Every day. Won, I guess. Every time. <laughs> I have never not won. And, and I, I tweeted something they earlier, which is hilarious. You, the, the thing is, it's the language that they send back. I, YouTube sends me back uh, the language of my videos have been not reviewed and been okay. They're saying, great news. Your videos, which we demonetized, took revenue away from you and then re decided that we had made a mistake and then reinstated <laughs> Are, are good. <laughs> Congratulations. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, all of the, the views, the watch time that would have been monetized is now no longer uh, readily available to me. So it's like, that shouldn't be great news. Whoever's writing that needs to change the language. It should be, we apologize. We're sorry. We know we made a mistake. You were right with your content. We, we are going to get better. And that those little things, when you're, you're dealing with a business of YouTube, which is really a business of hope, in my opinion, it's a business of creating something that's yours, that's sustainable, that can get you dreams that the nine to five can't, when you're dealing with that business and your your creators thrive on that, you need to be very careful about those sentiments. And uh, it's it's just been a long time building, and people are just frustrated right now. Uh, Natty, have you ever fought for the demonetization of a video? Yeah, I mean, ever since those changes came around about demonetization, um, and especially you know because of ads and and whatnot. Um, it's been, I mean, I have foul language in most of my videos. I'm a potty mouth. So <laughs> for me, I've had to, I've had to learn that, okay, maybe I need to upload this unlisted first, wait a few days, see if it gets tagged yeah. and then go for it. And I'm a, I'm a machinima managed partner. So like, I'm not your regular, I mean, I don't know how it goes with other networks, but there are, you know, a group of partners with machinima, the network that are specifically managed by them. So I don't get automatic copyright strikes on music and stuff like that. Um, and, and so you would think that I would get maybe a special treatment, but I don't. Most of my videos get flagged for demon demonetization. Um, and sometimes even when I don't have foul language in it, and I'm not sure if it's because somebody manually reviewed it, and, and I have no idea. We don't really know how it works completely. That's the problem. It's bad. Yeah, it's, ba it's a bad algorithm. It's a bad system, in my opinion. But I've, I've learned ways to get around it, just un upload unlisted. And I think that if this, all these changes can help... Um, you know, get back to a place where we can monetize our, our videos more easily when we are making good content, when we're making quality content. Yeah, sure, it may, might be adult themed, but, you know, humor. But my, you know, if your channel's set to be 18 and up, then you should be clear to go for all 18 and up ads, right? Sure. So hopefully this makes some changes. And yeah, it's definitely been frustrating to fight these. But again, ever since these changes started coming out, I kind of just started washing my hands of YouTube a little bit personally, so... Yeah, Rourke. Doing what that has, to a lot of people. Yeah, uh, Rourke. What's your been your experience been with this? Because I know you've been what on the platform since 2013. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I, I totally understand. I hear the voices of the creators. I have uh, had these discussions with YouTube on behalf of many creators, and uh, what we're hearing here is what you're hearing everywhere: is that there's a lot of frustration around the communication around the uh, automatic demonetization or limited ads put on videos that previously would have been acceptable. So uh, to me, I think that as far as the communication goes, uh, they need to be, with these changes, reinforcing the fact that this will ultimately, for their everyday creators, this is going to be a good thing. 
because there will be more of a manual process. There will be more people involved in actually being able to review these videos in a timely manner instead of waiting three days when the views are going to be gone and then saying, okay, great, your video is monetizing again, but what will it be monetizing on? The video is dead at that point. So to me, the biggest part of this that's not being talked about that's hugely significant is that we're talking about 99% of the people who were monetizing content on this platform were making insignificant amounts of money. And because of that overflow, because of the crowding on the platform, they had no choice but to make everything essentially automated in a series of you know, machine learning and algorithms to decide what is and what isn't appropriate when really the people who are getting more views, the people whose career is to be on YouTube deserve a higher touch more manual, direct, and quick response from the compliance team and in public. So I think that to me, that's the most inspiring part of this situation is that for the bigger creators, this is going to be a good thing. But I do feel that so far that hasn't been communicated as well as it could have been. Um, could you say, considering all the resources and all the time it takes on YouTube's part, just to have these thousands of channels running on their network, um, is it safe to say it just wasn't worth it if YouTube's only getting a very, very minuscule amount of money uh, from these channels that basically from a financial standpoint, it makes the most sense to shut down channels that don't even power like a single light at their office? <laughs> Right. I don't even think it's necessarily only a financial decision. It's also a decision of how do you want to treat the top creators on this platform who, through a meritocracy, have risen to the top, have gained a following, and should they really be thrown into the same water and be reviewed the same way as all these people who have uh, you know, new channels or are attempting to freeboot and rip off other channels? I mean, I think that what it does is it provides YouTube uh, ample manpower to actually be able to address these issues individually, hopefully, as far as compliance and the community guidelines are concerned. Sure. Uh, so, Evan, how do you think YouTube uh, can further work to repair their reputation and maybe gain back the trust of their content creators and advertisers? Well, you know, it's interesting when you whenever you have a, a repeated controversy uh, is involved in a company, you have to be very careful that everything you say and do, if it wasn't already under a microscope, will be under a further microscope uh, times 10 or times 20. How do you say so? Um, I think what Rourke is saying is right on the head. This is not affecting um, you know, the people who are making a living off of YouTube for the most part. This is affecting those who maybe wanted to try or making a few bucks, maybe got lucky here and had a big video uh, and had some ads. But what YouTube is trying to do is protect the system. They're trying to say that, you know, a lot of the things that started the first apocalypse were not from big channels like Logan Paul's channel. They were from random YouTube creators who weren't getting many views except that one. So having to police those ads onto content creators that A, are maybe just more likely to make a mistake rather than really help you, uh, uh, is definitely something that hopefully will provide more manpower for the for the overall system. I just think now what I would like to see from YouTube is how do we win in this current environment? It is changing so rapidly. How can you give a clear method for YouTubers to succeed on this platform? Because I've been doing a YouTube my, like as a part-time, full-time second job for about two years, and I am about as confused as everybody. I don't know what's going to get demonetized. I don't know what's going to hit randomly or what's not going to do it. Part of that's your fan base, but part of that is just being clear as to what is an actual monetizable and appropriate video that your algorithm supports. And I'll make more of that. I'll fit my own content into that. But I don't want to just get surprised after doing hours of work that, up, oh, this isn't okay. Our bot flagged it and not even know why. It doesn't even tell you why your video is demonetized. So, Do you think again, YouTube could even answer that? Yeah, and that's the problem. I don't know if they can. So maybe, you know, what Rourke was talking about, just removing the bandwidth allows them to have more personal conversations and to, and to take that extra step, even if it's just it was demonetized because of this thing in the thumbnail. It was demonetized because of these words you said that it picked up on. You could make you can make adjustments there. As a creator, you're supposed to make adjustments. You are, you're battling uphill, baby, if you want to make YouTube or Twitch a, a livelihood. So we're fine making adjustments, but we're not getting the feedback. Uh, that I think a lot of people feel they deserve. And honestly, I think a platform that has done this well deserves to put energy into. I know they're going to get it right, but this is, uh, you know, this is definitely something they need to work on. That would be my number one for them. 
Sure. Um, so, Natty, how do you think this will change uh, or affect like niche channels? Maybe with like specific how-to videos that uh, might only earn a like or views for just that one video, but they're not creating content on a regular basis. Um, I think people who are making that kind of content, I feel like a lot of the times they do it because they want to, and they might not. They might not necessarily be doing it to make money, especially if that's they have one hit video here and there. Um, so I don't see it stopping people who just really make videos because they're passionate about it. But I do think that it's going to discourage them from making them more often. Like I've been, I've been doing YouTube since 2012 and I used to be able to pay my rent with YouTube. And ever since the ad apocalypse stuff started, it's been slowly like my, my checks have been down and I just stopped caring about it. And at that point it's like, I can't even buy a coffee with my monthly <laughs> thing. So it's just like, damn, it's like, it's really, I have, I don't even think I've, yeah, I don't think I've uploaded in a month. Let's be honest there. So I, I'm not really a great example of a YouTuber anyway, but I'm an example of somebody who's like maybe mid tier that's gotten really discouraged from it. Um, and I am passionate about it, but I'm also passionate about Twitch and streaming. So um, I have my other outlets. I can also upload videos to Twitch. Um, they're better about advertising on Twitch. So I, I feel like I'm putting all my videos and my and that kind of content now to other platforms because it has this search over the years already. So hopefully this does something to bring back, you know, more ad revenue and more and more advertisers, more confidence in the platform. I've also had an issue personally, like and I've seen other people have issues with just their um, their policing of certain content. Like there's definitely some content that shouldn't be out there. And, and even stuff that's like it seems it's it's like predatory content made for kids. I noticed here in the notes, oh, yeah. and I've seen those pop up, and that stuff is crazy. And the fact that that there's so many of those videos that are um, kind of supposed to be looking like they're for kids, but they involve these exactly like these violent themes, these sexual themes, and stuff like that. It's like insane that they haven't policed it enough to get all these videos off the platform. And once they start taking care of this stuff a little more, I think it's gonna I think it's gonna help a lot. But I think it's gonna take a lot of time for everybody to, to start feeling the encouragement again. Sure. So I'm glad you brought that up. Brings me to my next question. Uh, we can So we can safely assume that the this kind of toxic children's content really lit a fire under YouTube to make some changes. Uh, but clearly the Logan Paul video where he filmed the dead body in Japan was the final straw. Um, so why did it take this long and such an alarming piece of content to finally, finally get YouTube to react? Rourke, what do you think? Well, I can say just having worked with YouTube on a pretty much daily basis for almost six years, uh, I can tell you that they do take those things very seriously, but because of the amount of content, you look at how much content's uploaded every day and how much on, is on the platform, and a lot of it was where do you draw this line in terms of assuming the best in most uploads versus assuming that things are going to potentially be extremely negative or targeted towards children or an incident with someone like Logan Paul who for years and years posted without issue and then all of a sudden decided to walk into the suicide forest. So when you're, when you're dealing with something like that, I do know as far as YouTube stance, they took a hard line on the kids' content prior to anything that happened uh, with the Logan Paul fallout. I can, I can tell you that that was something that was a great concern of theirs. They were making uh, a lot of effort to get out there and remove anything targeted towards children, specifically looking at metadata, looking at the way people are approaching those things. But again, it also comes back to me. I think Evan made a great point earlier, and I've mentioned uh, this to people who I work with at YouTube a lot, is that Compliance is policy to not give you feedback on why you have a violation, a video remove, a strike, uh, to a more extreme uh, video suspension or channel suspension. Without that feedback, how is the strike system supposed to help creators readjust, improve their content, and avoid those issues in the future? Until they're more clear than just sending a link to a page that anybody could Google, until they're willing to specify the violations that lead to these issues, people are going to be discouraged because they're going to get a strike, feel that it's unfair, and then their answer is basically deal with it. It's one of these, but we won't tell you what you violated. And I think that's a problem. Sure. Um, do you think the changes are too little too late to kind of rescue or save the platform in a sense? No, I don't think it's too little too late. I mean, when you're YouTube, when you're a verb, 
for looking up a video across <laughs> the world, Good point. Um, yep. you get a certain benefit of the doubt, right? I mean, they are the premier platform to look for a video for the common person, for gamers, for all kinds of things. They're still high up there uh, as far as the place to get that video content. So no, I don't think it's too little too late. But I do think that in an effort to clear these things up quickly and cleanly, uh, they had to, you know, just take, they were taking a lot of videos down, removing a lot of monetization and asking questions later, which is understandably frustrating. And I think that the bandwidth in, in combination with the efforts that they were making that were a reaction to dealing with these issues that advertisers have pointed out were greatly concerning to them, and rightfully so, uh, of course, is going to be frustrating to creators who are then getting flagged and demonetized who didn't earn that. So again, I go back to my big point and all that is I understand how and why YouTube reacted the way they did. And I understand that there's a process you go to to make the, the advertisers happy again. But you have to talk a little more than just sending links and telling people that it's a violation without an explanation. Sure. So, uh, you know, obviously transparency has been brought up a couple times here and just YouTube communicating better with, with their audience and with their creators. So if YouTube is worried about too much content to kind of check it all, does that mean that these new guidelines are specifically meant to cut down on content and maybe discourage some of these smaller channels? Uh, Evan, what do you think? I mean, personally, I think it's, it's not meant to cut down on content. What it's meant to do is to show let let YouTube see through a, a person's and an individual's effort who really wants to make content, who really wants to be a part of the platform the way that YouTube wants to support. YouTube, as we've seen over the years, has started delving away from views, away from those three minute awesome videos, highly edited into I want to see how many how many how many minutes a week are people watching your channel? Are you a, a basically serving as a TV show that people will turn into and steal away from Netflix, steal away from Amazon, steal away from other things that are competing for 18 to 30 year olds and their watch time? And so as this really is developing, what YouTube, I think, is trying to say is that we want to support people who are committed. Uh, but by doing this change, we also get to basically cut down on some of the biggest risks, which are those YouTubers who are not partnered yet, who are not kind of at that very established range where they're willing to put out a video that crosses some guidelines, some ad guidelines, just because who cares if they get their YouTube channel? They're only making two cents, you know? I, I think that's something that YouTube is trying to avoid by saying, once we get you in the game, once you are committed and you get to this level, you're probably not gonna be one of our offenders that's gonna hurt our ad system and our platform overall. Sure. Uh, so, Natty, you talked about moving over to Twitch. I mean, where else do you see these creators going? Do you think they're going to move away from YouTube and go to Twitch or go somewhere else? Um, do you think we're going to see a significant decrease of content across the platform? Um, I don't necessarily think there's going to be a huge decrease, but, I mean, I, I started on Twitch and, and then started my YouTube after, so for me, it's like I'm going back home, but... Um, <laughs> Some people, uh, they, they found other platforms to do other types of content. And now I know we're going to talk about it later, but there's, you know, this new feature on Twitch that they've added to kind of up the excitement about pre-recorded videos. So I think that might pull some people away a little bit more. Um, but, I mean, there's Twitter as well. Some people are able to monetize videos on Twitter. Um, there's various other sites. Uh, but there it's never been as easy to get monetized as it is on YouTube, minus the, all the ad drama. <laughs> but right. um, I, I don't like. I don't see people leaving in you know mass exodus. But I, I do no. see people trying to seek other platforms to create some type of content on rather than YouTube. Yeah, uh, Rourke, what do you think? Do you think people will be moving to a different platform? Well, I think certainly uh, there's going to be channels and there are going to be people, especially in the gaming community, if they're frustrated. You know, you have Twitch there. Uh, they're investing more in their VOD services. Uh, Amazon and other companies like that are always around. But, you know, again, it comes back to YouTube is um, the premier, the original platform for this kind of content. And they're trying to bridge that gap between we want to be authentic to original creators, people that grew on this platform to become... Uh, stars on the internet in their own right, people who made their way on YouTube. I think they want to continue to support them and help them grow and reach more and more people across the world. But in order to do that, uh, as they've both mentioned, 
they have to make it harder to get to a point where you're actually monetizing on YouTube because I think they do, frankly, want to discourage channels that are uh, making money on compilations of third-party content or making yeah. most of their money just relying on other users and other content and people who potentially are you know, abusing the platform. So if, if that's the compromise, is making it more difficult to get to that point um, I think ultimately, if anything, it will bring more people back. All right, so Anati, you brought up the new uh, video producer tools on Twitch, and it was just yesterday this was revealed, and these include letting creators make landing pages, countdown timers, reruns for their content, and adding a new feature entitled premieres. Um, so do you guys think that Twitch is moving toward becoming a replacement platform for YouTube, or does Twitch still have a long way to go? Evan, what do you got? Personally, I think it's going to be tough. It's always been tough, but they're so good at, at their timing, aren't they? Twitch seems to like, I don't know how they do it, but whenever YouTube has a crisis, hey, Twitch now does a little something similar to YouTube. Come exactly, on over. Natty. Exactly. Check it out. You guys don't like red? Well, how about purple? It's just a little bit darker and, you know. Uh, basically, what I love about uh, Twitch is that they are, you know, continuing to be a better platform in general. I love Twitch. I stream on Twitch. Um, I, I, I did YouTube and Twitch at the same time. When you get to a certain point, you do have to choose, though. You could be a Twitch streamer and upload what you did on mm. Twitch half-heartedly <laughs> on YouTube, or you could be a YouTuber and then stream occasionally. You cannot do both full-time unless you just have, you know, no girlfriend, no life, no, you know, other job, which is a very rare place to be in. But I think what they're doing here is fighting against their branding right now, and it's I love that they're doing it, but it is definitely a hard thing to do. Twitch is known as the live streaming service. I don't know if people are gonna all of a sudden change their behaviors to go and watch uh, pre-edited content on there. Um, but if they bring enough in that first draw, if they do a couple of big deals, they bring some big creators over there who start releasing some important content to people, you know, and I'm talking like the PewDiePie's, the Markiplier, th those level guys. If they could bring those guys, their audience will follow. So that could start a, a change in the dynamic, well, which it, hopefully. Yeah. It's funny yeah. you brought that up because they decided to deal with Disney uh, to bring oh. Markiplier and Strawberry and a couple other folks over to create content for uh, for Disney as well. So it is happening. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that's the way I could maybe do it. There you go. Um, so, Natty, in your experience, which service has been uh, more successful or convenient uh, for you as a content creator? Well, I mean, it's always a little bit more convenient to just go live, honestly. Yep. Um, if always. you're not doing as much, I mean, for me, it doesn't seem so. I do a lot of <laughs> high production stuff, so there's always something breaking, but... <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's a little different. Like, I love making pre-recorded content and editing, and I used to do all kinds of crazy effects on my videos, and I, I also did Twitch and YouTube full-time together at the same time, and it is exhausting. You really can't do it. Eventually, what happened to me is that I couldn't do it all at the same time, and then the adpocalypse started happening a while ago on, on YouTube, and that really discouraged me from doing YouTube, so I just chose Twitch because, for me, it is a little easier. But I have tried to incorporate... Um, making uh, streams, because because before they've released these producer tools, um, you could stream your uh, uploads as videos, but now they're trying, they've created this tool to make it, um, you know, like more of an event, and I think that it'll help. I don't think it's going to necessarily take over YouTube right now, but I, like, I think they are doing the right things at the right time, Twitch is always kind of one, I feel like they're always like one step ahead of the curve on everything like this, yeah. and... <laughs> They really need to kind of keep down this trend if they want to take over the the, the VOD platform, you know, title. <laughs> so I, I think that they're doing good things, but I, uh, I can't wait to see what's next, really. They do say that there's more coming, so I'm really excited to see what that is. Definitely. Uh, lots of people in chat are agreeing with you, Evan, on your previous statement. Uh, Patrick in chat says, I'm a small creator and I'm still going to post and stream to YouTube, but I just can't use their system at all. It sucks. Sooner or later, YouTube is going to have to take a step back, come up with a proper plan and set it into motion. Until then, it is a fractured mess. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how a small creator feels. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, Rourke, tell me, do you think Twitch is unique and that its monetization strategy doesn't just revolve around ads. I mean, we've got things like Twitch Bits, you have subscriptions, you have Amazon wish lists. Um, what, what are your thoughts there? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think Twitch is a great platform uh, dealing with the gaming community as much as I do. I certainly know that Twitch has its place. People are very dedicated to it. As far as will people flock to it as an alternative, maybe. I mean, we're, you know, we have uh, Arcade Cloud is a, a big part of what we do here at Omnia. We have a channel that's an O&O called Arcade Cloud. It's adult gaming content. Of course, there's some concern there about how will that monetize potentially as it is adult oriented in much of uh, the comedy that we do. And we recently launched an Arcade Cloud Twitch channel that's on 24 hours. So that's very appealing. It's a, it's a great new way to get that content out there. And, you know, I think, again, as these guys said, I think the key is that Twitch seems to always be ahead of the game in knowing what the issues are that are concerning to content creators especially to streamers, and they just seem to always be the, the shoulder to cry on and the place to go uh, when things maybe go awry or when advertisements uh, mm -hmm. are, are not getting the job done for them on other platforms. Yeah. It's like that, it's like that guy in the friend zone whenever you have a relationship, <laughs> he's just always right there. <laughs> Like, hey, let's um, talk about it. Come over. I'll, I'll cook you dinner. Let's, let's talk. <laughs> uh, so we did have a conversation um, about YouTube as a platform back on uh, January 5th, and we had John Brents from Full Screen uh, said that it's time for content creators to stop thinking of YouTube as the platform and start thinking of it as a search engine. So is this going to be a shift for smaller content creators to use YouTube's hosting of their videos as maybe a way to push other revenue streams or themselves, i.e. maybe merchandise, public appearances, sponsored content? Uh, Evan, what do you think? 100%. I mean, I cannot tell you. This last year has been a wake-up call because uh, you're doing the same thing you're doing, and all of a sudden you're making 70% less money than you were making the year before. So you have to think of how can I take my audience, engage them, and then also have them have a meaningful way to support me and then get value out of it. That's a lot of what Twitch does really well with subscriptions. You get a, you emotes, you get special privileges, you get special giveaway. You, you feel like you are getting something out of that support. With YouTube, it's a little different because you have to watch and then once you're watching, you have to become engaged enough to where you do take that next step when they say, hey, here's a product I'm supporting or here's a, here's a t-shirt that I'm putting out that people want that. So I think if you are a YouTuber, if you're planning on using this as a platform, I agree taking you know off the blinders and maybe looking at the bigger picture of things and how your video will relate not just to your audience but to to more, more people. Maybe how it will stay and be relevant for not just today or tomorrow or this week but for years, some of the best videos I've made, I made like two years ago, and they are still relevant today. And they still are getting me the most watch time out of almost any of my videos because they're relevant. So as long as you can think a little bit farther ahead, you can make this something that's a lot safer. I'm, I'm a big fan of residual income, uh, this place, this place, a little bit here. And I think that's something that a lot of content creators now, I would highly recommend looking at. All right, so with a number of content creators speaking out about burnout, depression, and the difficulties involved with maintaining their channel in YouTube's competitive space, do you think these changes are going to hurt them, or will the new rules weed out less driven creators and allow a healthier environment for those willing to put in the time and the work? Natty? I think it's going to definitely weed out some people who just really am like, you know what, I don't feel like it anymore. Like. I was a very hard working, I would upload a video every day and I would stream at least every day or every other day. And I think that it's definitely going to make some of those people who are just, you know, exhausted kind of give up on, on YouTube, at least for a little bit. If, if it's not making them, if it's not paying their bills, it's not making them bread and butter, then it's going to definitely discourage you. But I think if, if somebody's really passionate about it, they're going to continue on. I, I don't think they're going to be stopping anytime soon. Um, to, to pass to add on to what um, Evan just said is that I, I'm one of the people who actually started seeking to use YouTube literally as a search engine to promote my other stuff, my merch. I've made like hmm. little TV ads and for my shirts and stuff and put them on there. I've basically done most for the past year. I've mostly done branded paid content on my YouTube channel for the majority of it. You'll see sponsored this video sponsored by blah blah blah, and that's how I've gotten around the adpocalypse. Is like pretty much trying to get all my content sponsored or only making content when it is sponsored because otherwise it wouldn't it wouldn't be worth it for me to spend all that time. I'm a perfectionist when it comes to my videos. I spend hours and hours and sometimes days editing one video. Um, and or I'm hiring somebody else to do it 
and paying out of my pocket. And if I'm losing money on those videos, then I can't hire an editor. And then I can't do this and that and this. So, yeah, it's going to definitely make people choose uh, for a little bit. But hopefully, with all the changes and stuff, maybe it'll, maybe it'll fix it. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah. Uh, Rourke, would you agree? Do you think these new rules will weed out less driven creators and allow the, a healthier environment for those willing to put in the time and work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the intent of the policy, right? Is people who are not able to be consistent performers on the platform, people who aren't going to dedicate the time to build up an audience, to consistently <laughs> bring content to that audience in the format that YouTube has provided, uh, of course, that's, that's part of the plan, is to weed out people who are either quote unquote bad actors or people who are less motivated to grow themselves on the platform. Uh, because again, look, uh, it's, it's not all about money, but if we're talking about people making a livelihood here, if the difference between making $96 over the course of 12 months and not making $96 over the course of 12 months is what kills your dream of being a YouTube star. Maybe you didn't have a dream of being a YouTube star that's realistic. That's true. That's a great point. Uh, we got a, another comment in chat from Alan. He says, I'm on the list of small YouTubers. I make gaming, vlogs, and stop motions. When the news hit that YouTube was allowing people to make money, I jumped all over it. But here I am battling, struggling, and fighting to make it and prove I committed to what I do. I stream on Twitch occasionally, but YouTube is my home. When I heard the new guidelines on top of needing an AdSense account, it hurts me that I can't get paid doing what I love, which is making videos. So it's interesting that he brings up stop motion because think of all the work that goes into a stop motion video and that he probably can't turn out a bunch of those enough to kind of meet the views and the guidelines that YouTube has set in place. So uh, interesting point from Alan, thank you. Uh, we gotta get moving into our second topic uh, for today. But before we get there, I do wanna ask our viewers, uh, let us know what video game topics you're discussing and debating. If you have an idea for a news story or debate topic, send us a message and we might just discuss it on the show. Alongside an outbreak of gaming-related crimes, developers and publishers worldwide have begun cracking down on hackers that have been making money while damaging the integrity of their video games. PUBG's Chinese publisher Tencent has teamed up with local authorities to take down those who have been selling cheats for their game. According to Bloomberg, 30 cases have already resulted in 120 arrests nationwide, with more expected to be made in the upcoming months. Do you think these sorts of crimes are worth arresting someone over? Rourke, what do you got? Well, this is an interesting, uh, an interesting question. It's a time when there's going to be a line that will be drawn as far as are the actions that you take via an avatar or in-game punishable by law to a real person outside that game. I think you have, to, you have to factor in the way that this industry has changed and what it means. In 2017, the video game industry was a $116 billion industry. So we're talking about serious money and serious time that people are putting into this. So if you're going out of the way to ruin the experience that other people are spending their hard-earned money to be a part of, to hurt a game that publishers have put out and spent a lot of money to develop, and you're hurting that product or the longevity of that product, then yeah, that's something that needs to be taken seriously. Now, as far as uh, should people be arrested, uh, I think that it, it's all circumstantial as the law always is, and it depends on what the circumstances are and what steps were taken ahead of time. So. If, is there, does there need to be a system in place where there, you, you, know, you get a warning or you get your account suspended or you lose your access to play a certain game live first before you get arrested? Sure. But if people are affecting other people's lives and the money and the economy of the industry, then there does need to be an example set to show that this is something that won't be tolerated, especially when a lot of the people who are cheating are creating micro economies around cheating. So do you think cheating is more of a nuisance or is it truly a crime? I think it depends on the game and it depends on the, on the circumstance. Um, in, in the case of people exploiting the ability for uh, in-game currency that then hurts that company and hurts the people who you know, work so hard in those games, uh, both as players and as developers, then I think that that's something that really needs to be taken seriously. Uh, and is not just a nuisance. I do think that it's something that, that is potentially criminal. 
But again, what is the, I think that it's not just black or white. I think it's not throw someone in jail or totally let them off. I think there has to be a, a stage of proper progression to punish these people who are potentially repeat offenders. Sure. Uh, Patrick in chat agrees with your work. He says people shouldn't be cheating in online games in the first place, period. As for arrested, it all depends on the severity of the act itself. Uh, Evan, would you agree or do you have your own thoughts? Where do you see the line being on whether or not you're arrested or not arrested for cheating in a game? I honestly think that this line is going to blend as we just go through the years of the 2000s, honestly. I mean, you, you look at Ready Player One coming out. It's one of my favorite books, uh, and it's the Steven Spielberg movie coming out this year. Uh, and it talks about what happens when everyone is just living in a virtual world, and everyone is just committed to that is also a very important part of my life. I don't think we're there yet. Obviously, VR isn't quite there, and, and gaming hasn't developed. But when you talk about one player being able with either software or whether it's discrimination or, or online hate or harassment to ruin the experience of 100 players, if you look at the economy of maybe this is the biggest game in the world, maybe those 100 players represent $1,000 to that game. But maybe in 10 years, it represents $10,000 to that game. Maybe in a few years, it represents 100000 uh, Who knows? When, when it gets to the level that it is serious money and it is serious cost that is being caused, uh, then I think it will become more and more punishable. But I love the way that PUBG handles it. You know, when you t you look at they don't they have a very aggressive streamer ban uh, kind of uh, policy where if someone is going against a streamer and they're why am I blank? I'm blanking on the word. You guys know what I'm talking about though. Stream sniping. Basically, stream sniping. Yeah, there we stream go. snipe a streamer. A <laughs> streamer. Mm -hmm. Uh, they banned them. And I, I think this is, re it's, it's kind of revolutionary because not a lot of people have aggressive stances like this. Uh, but I think it's great because it, it doesn't tolerate that community getting built in the first place. Um, despite people wanting to make their way around it. I, I think this is more and more where we will see games who really want to protect their investments, uh, start going with either online harassment, cheating, discrimination, et cetera. Um, so, Natty, to what extent do you think cheating really damages a game? Does it render it unplayable, and at what point? Sometimes it can. Um, to add to the, mm -hmm. I, I have to say, PUBG does try to do stuff about stream sniping and stuff. But personally, I've been stream sniped by somebody else who was streaming, and we reported them on Twitch, and they got banned on Twitch. However, I provided evidence to PUBG that they stream sniped me, and they didn't ban them on the game. So, I'm not sure how well uh. that system works. Personally, it has not worked for me, um, but it, it hasn't deterred me from playing PUBG, but another game similar, uh, DayZ. When DayZ came out, there was griefers and hackers who would come in and just completely harass people nonstop. Um, I was somebody who was harassed nonstop by a certain group of hackers for a while, um, and it definitely deterred me from playing that game. I, I actually don't think I've played that game since. <laughs> Wow. But it's yeah. it's not it's not probably everybody's cup of tea. Like maybe maybe if somebody's getting harassed over and over again by somebody who's cheating in game, um, maybe it'll deter them. Maybe it'll just deter them for a few days. Who knows? But I think that overall, I think that it's more important to punish, especially legally, the people who are creating these hacks, and less of you know the kids who are buying using these them. hacks and using them. I think that, yeah, maybe they should be banned in game, but I don't think you should take legal action against them. Otherwise, like this case with the 14-year-old kid, I think that's a little extreme um, that Fortnite did where it was a 14-year-old kid using cheats in game. He displayed them on his YouTube channel, which I think, okay, take the video down, ban them from game, but then I wouldn't personally think that it's, I don't think it's good to go any further than that. It's just a kid at this point. So I would mm. definitely appreciate if they went more after the creators of these of these hacks and these exploits. And I would definitely like it if they took more of the harassment in game more seriously, because that's always mm. been a huge issue. And I never see too much happening with um, the policing of that very much. I mean, unless the stream sniping, you want to count that, but it didn't work that well for me. So I don't that's a know. Good point. All right, so uh, with games that have player bases as large as PUBG's, are cheats just inevitable? Should we just expect for them to happen and just accept their existence? Rourke, what do you think? Well, I think that that was a great point, that we should be going after the people that are creating the ability for these kids to cheat. I mean, that's really the root of the problem, right? And if you yeah. want to talk about how it's affecting the actual developers and how it's affecting other people's gameplay, then... That's the root of the problem, and they have to be serious about that. 
as far as in-game, people taking advantage of cheats and, and going those ways, I don't think that they should be punished the same way as somebody who has created a whole company. Again, somebody who is profiting off of essentially breaking a product and ruining a video game uh, as much as you know a, a kid, Pekingese 96, for getting out there and just exploiting this when they don't know any better. They're 14 years old. So to me, I haven't checked the math on 96 to 14, by the way. I know I'm off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old to think about it. So uh, to me, what's important is the integrity of the games and, again, appropriate penalties, whether it be an in-game penalty to someone who's a minor who didn't realize the severity of the crime that they're supporting, or actually taking legal action against people who are making an effort to break these games and ruin the experience. Because I know for a lot of creators and, and for people who play games, including myself, one of the great things about games is that you know life isn't fair. But if you're playing an online game and no one's cheating, the game can be fair. It can be based on how well you've played that game, how well that you've been grinding in that game and, and the time and the effort you've put into improving in it. So it's extremely frustrating, especially in games uh, that are one life online games, that somebody can come in into a game of 100 people and one person cheating can ruin it for everybody. Very true. So uh, some of these cheating, or I should say most of these cheating websites are very easy to find and oftentimes look like professional, well-made uh, websites. How does something so blatant manage to fly under the radar? And just uh, how do these cheating websites get away with it for as long as they do? Evan, what do you think? I mean, how does a you know how does a, a, a you know a dead body make it a trending on YouTube? These are the same <laughs> same questions that need to be answered. Wow. Uh, it's not enough policing. That's it. And it's the it's a big world out there on the internet, and you know there's never going to be the right perfect answer for this. Um, and there are going to be those people who have the systems in place, and the system will always need to be having a system to counter it. And it's the same thing with crime and law today. I mean, if you know, I, I think we're always going to have issues with that, and there's going to need to be police. There's going to need to be somebody who has the check and balance of. <clears throat> People who try to get outside of the rules and do their own thing. That's just a part of human nature. Um, my biggest thing is, you know, I don't feel too strongly either way as to what the perfect answer is. But I do hope that not only companies take accountability, but the people using them take accountability as well. I think we should discourage this. I remember when I was 14, I was very aware of myself. I was not some idiot running around like, what is, you know, what is life? How do I breathe? What, what do I, how, is this chewing? What does this do? Food going down? Ah, I get it. I was like still living. And I think that there is some component to the fact that there needs to be accountability on both sides, the user and the person who is creating this. And finding the perfect answer is going to be a difficult thing that I think is honestly going to be driven by whatever is causing gaming companies the most money. And when Blizzard took that uh, cheap maker down, it was because they have something that they're putting hundreds of millions of dollars into uh, with the Overwatch League and with that new game and the popularity of that. It was that important of uh, an IP for them to go after it. So I think money, truthfully, is going to drive the action that a lot of these companies take. So uh, raising the, the point of money, if a, if a cheater's banned from the game and wants to continue playing, um, they are forced to buy another copy of the game. There are obviously no guarantees cheaters will buy another copy, but are developers actually benefiting from cheaters? Rourke, what do you think? Uh, I definitely wouldn't say the developers are benefiting from cheaters. <laughs> uh, is that Are the handful of people that aren't going to be overly frustrated that are going to rebuy the game going to make up for people essentially breaking their product? No, I don't think so. Yeah, no. No, uh, Evan, you disagree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I work at a gaming company. So I, I actually, I work at High Res Studios, so I'm in the development side on a daily basis as well as on the streamer and the, the YouTuber side. Cheaters are the most like vehemently hated thing from a community perspective. People are disgusted with cheaters when it comes to high level play, and especially when you look at esports, because I'm also an esports broadcaster. It's just one of those things that our pros hate more than anything. It is very detrimental to our game. We have a whole um, community of people in the office who are just tasked with dealing with that and dealing with complaints. Uh, it's something developers take very seriously and, and try with anti-cheat software to, to get away from as much as possible. There's, there's really no benefit that I see or I've ever heard about of you know mm -hmm. that being something good for us. So, I mean, 
Why, why are cheats and hacks so difficult to, uh, to combat? Is it just there isn't enough resources being dedicated to keeping the game clear of them? I mean, at, working you know, at, a, at a developer, Evan, what do you, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I, I honestly think that there are just smart people out there in the world. I mean, think about it. There's, there's people who could hack into government systems right now who wouldn't know what to do. I mean, and that is the, the, the people who sometimes take it amongst themselves to do things that are not okay. Uh, personally, I just think that there's just very intelligent people who know how to work around a system. And it's harder to be the guy making the system of the anti-cheat because then people realize what you're doing and then they're like, okay, so how, here's how I get away from this system. Here's how, how I get around from this blocker. Then you kind of have to react and make something that blocks off those pathways. It's pretty difficult. It's more of a reactionary situation than really getting ahead of the game as far as blocking cheats. Mm -hmm. So, Natty, why do you think there's such a blasé attitude toward cheating by some of, say, younger gamers? I can't, I can't even roll them all into being younger gamers. I'm sure it's people of all ages right. that are cheating. But where did this attitude come from? Is it because there hasn't been proper uh, consequences for it prior? Um, possibly, or possibly that, you know, some people can pass it off and may not be considered... They, some people might not consider them cheating. They might not realize they're cheating. They might be able to go show their friends, like, oh, look how well I did in this game. Uh, look, you know, how awesome I am. I just killed 12 people, headshots, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and they might still get some <laughs> gratification out of it, you know? So maybe, maybe there, I mean, there's all kinds of people on the internet. Anon <laughs> anonymity is, you know, kind of terrible at times when it comes to not only cheating, but, you know, like harassment, things like that. So if they can get away yep. with it, people are still going to do it. So until there's no way for them to get away with it anymore. I don't think it's going to be across the board a hated thing. I think there's definitely going to be some trolls and some just kind of awful people out there taking advantage of that. Or just immature, naive people who don't realize how terrible it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, they haven't learned yet because they haven't died to somebody cheating and been so frustrated and salty over it for like a week. <laughs> so, <laughs> or maybe they know. were and that's why they downloaded the cheat. <laughs> To <laughs> maybe like, that looks awesome. Yeah. I'm gonna do that. Yeah. And maybe, maybe they don't have the judgment to see like, oh, well, maybe that's you know, two wrongs don't make a right kind of thing. You know, maybe they don't know yep. yet. But yep. I wanted to say to this person commenting in the chat, like Go a 14 year old it. kid advertising a game, try or a, a a cheat in a game, uh, trying to make profit off it is still just a kid making a video. Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. They're not making the cheats. So I think you know maybe even an IP ban for some of these cheaters. So that way, even if they do go and buy another account, they're not able to play the game unless they change their, you know, they throw on uh, some some IP hiders, some proxies or some something to, to get around that. That's going to give them bad ping. It's going to make the game bad for them. So maybe it'll deter them, mm -hmm. obviously, from trying to come back in and cheat again. But I don't think it's still okay to try to go after them legally, like, you know, sue them and this and that. I don't think that's necessary. I think that it's more necessary to go after the creators of the cheats um, and to really just find a way. And, and people are smart. They're going to find a way around it still. But the more that we can do to stop them from joining again. At the root of the problem, basically, rather yeah. than putting yeah. a Band-Aid on the issue. So, um, all right. So by placing better in PUBG, for example, I'm earning a certain amount of battle points. And those points allow me to unlock crates for gear. I can then turn around and sell that gear for real dollars. So does an out-of-game economy incentivize cheating? Rourke, what do you think? Absolutely incentivizes cheating. Um, I mean, this is the reason why a lot of these people are creating these microeconomies. And look, uh, I agree that we shouldn't be immediately jumping to the point where we're saying, okay, this 14-year-old is knowingly advertising a way to cheat. Thus, you know, we should burn them at the stake. No. But let's also be clear that, as Evan also pointed out, when you're 14, let's not pretend you're three. When you're 14 years old, you have a moral compass. You know the consequences of what you're doing. You have a basic understanding of how you know, the simplistic elements of an economy work. Uh, if you're 14 years old and you got caught pirating movies from a major motion picture studio, they could try you in court potentially as an adult. So let's not pretend that they're not hurting another economy in the same way. Now, again, uh, they might not understand the severity of it because there is a culture that supports it. So, uh, again, to go back to how do we make a strong stance or how do these developers do something that's strong enough 
on the the legal level for the root of the problem, and then in game, you know whether it, whether it is blocking IPs or whether it's hurting their ability to play these games in the future. Um, how do you appropriately handle this and discourage this behavior going forward? Uh, great point. So, so Evan, should these games that have uh, items that you can get from, say, loot boxes, should they make it so you can turn around and not trade them or not sell them to either your friend or another person? Um, I think that's going to be on the game's choice. I mean, it depends. A lot of developers, you, you get down to the line, and knowing this intimately is that developers are not these types of super insane people that are just on a different planet. There are some who are, you know, absolute, you know, Mensas, the geniuses, but most people are normal guys. They're normal women. They're normal people who love games and are just making decisions the best that they know. We're all making mistakes in gaming development. There is no doubt about it, and we're all getting a lot of things right, and it's just a process of feedback uh, in terms of what we need to do. I'm sure a lot of these companies did not expect that those loot boxes would be, you know, when they put them in the game, that the cheating and, and selling it would encourage that behavior. But moving forward, now that this has happened, now that this is a thing, people who make new games and include those systems have to be more aware of, hey, what are we gonna do if this comes to play? Do we have something in place as a response? What's our stance on this? I think when companies do that and they develop a stance and they stick to it, it lets their players know what they can get into. Um, so, Natty, where is the line between cheating and taking advantage of tips and tricks? I mean, downloading an illegal software <laughs> add-on or something. <laughs> I think that's probably a pretty that's good line. That's probably the line, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're exploiting something that's broken in the game, that's already been acknowledged and it's trying to be fixed, uh, I mean, obviously a lot of games have rules, like if you find an, a known exploit or if you're, if you find it while you're playing, that's fine if you're going to stream it or you're going to put it on YouTube, but... Uh, if you're going to keep exploiting it after you find that, uh, that's when I think you can draw the line on that. But otherwise, I mean, cheating is cheating. Uh, I, I, this, I mean, there's a line. Download the program down, or install the hacks, whatever. I don't, I don't ever cheat, so I don't really know how that works. But <laughs> I'd rather just be bad at the game and have fun. That's, that's who I am. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it's too difficult to draw a line there. All right. We're coming to the end of our show, and I'd like to thank all of our viewers and our guests for being here. Tell us your final thoughts and where people can find you on social media, starting with Evan. Well, I got to say it's been awesome. Thank you, uh, Nadi, Rourke, and Mandy, all of you guys at the uh, show. It's been great being here. Uh, I hope to be back at some point in my life. But uh, you guys can find me on Twitter at Rain Day Gaming. You can check out that YouTube channel I was talking about that's always getting demonetized at Rain Day Gaming on YouTube as well. Uh, and, of course, I'm twitch.tv slash Rain Day if you guys want to catch me when I'm live. Uh, but overall, I think as far as gaming topics in terms of cheating, in terms of the things we discussed today, it, it's YouTube's policies, it's a work in progress. We're getting there. You know, it seems bad because we're in the thick of things, but we will make it out. Gamers are very persevering, very, uh, I think, uh, able to trudge through the mud kind of people uh, who love what they do, and they do it because they love it. Uh, so I'm very, very optimistic about the future for this industry. All right. Thank you, Evan. Natty, your final thoughts and where people can find you online. Yeah, it's been a pleasure today. Thank you to all the other guests, and they thank you, Mandy, and everybody at Game Talk Live. Um, I think that uh, Evan's right. I think it's going to be, I think there's a lot of optimism here for the future of uh, content creation. Um, when I, in, I I went to a financial advisor and they're like, so what are you going to do long term? And that's like the question that content creators have. Like, how is this going to work out for me long term? And I think if these, you know, Twitch and YouTube and, and video game companies crack down on all these things individually, like advertisements and cheating and all that, I think it's just going to do nothing but good in the future as long as you know they're still working they don't towards making these these things all work together in unison to make content creation easier and to monetize and make a living off of i think it's going to do well in the future um overall sorry i keep repeating myself but it's, it's just i'm not sure it's really that oh sorry siri please no <laughs> <laughs> all right natty where can people find you online no, I uh, I can be found at the Zombie Unicorn with Noe and Zombie pretty much everywhere, and I will be streaming from Indie Beauty Expo next Wednesday from 3 to 8 p.m. Pacific. So that'll Lovely. be a super fun day to come check out my stream. Thanks, Daddy. All right, Rourke, your final thoughts and where people can find you online. Sure. Uh, well, thank you, Mandy, for having me. I've enjoyed my first time here on the program, Great, thank and uh, Natty and uh, Evan, really insightful, really interesting to hear your guys' opinions on all these topics. 
you know, I think that the future is, is bright for this, not just because there's a lot of will people run from this platform to that platform. Well, the future is all these platforms. Uh, the way people consume their entertainment is it's going to be, it's going to continue to be Twitch and YouTube and, and new platforms that will come along. So I think uh, all these improvements will only be for the better and it's only going to help people legitimize themselves as creators on these platforms as a career. So I look forward to seeing that and how people grow. Um, you can catch me uh, at, at Arcade Cloud is the account that I run here for Arcade Cloud. Uh, if you want to go to my personal account, it's at Rourke B on Twitter. Uh, you can catch me tonight hosting a retro gaming segment live on Twitch on Arcade Cloud Live. Uh, it's going to be hosted by OMG It's Firefox and MC Sports Hawk. It starts at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific. And uh, if you want to check that out, it's going to be really cool. And if you stick around to the end, you can see me play some Tech Mobile. All right. Thanks, Rourke. And thanks to everyone who watched, commented, and shared the show. I also want to let our viewers know that tonight at 6 p.m. Pacific, you can tune in to the season finale of our sister show, Dragons and Stuff, before they begin their move to a new network. You can check out their future adventures at Facebook.com slash Some Dragon Show. I'm Mandy Roman. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and watch Game Talk Live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Have a great weekend.